Um, this is chapter 8, or we're going to cha tackle chapter 8 and chapter 9 today. I need to remind you to get your histories in. Um, we have, I think I have three so far. I think I do. Maybe I have more. Uh, so just email them to me once you get your history done. Uh, you need to create a character that has uh, has a problem uh, that you can use. Uh, you, you will be that character when people start counseling. Uh, and that is what needs to happen. Okay, we're going to tackle chapter 8 and chapter 9. Chapter 8 has to do with... Uh, wait a minute. Chapter 8 has to do with expressing understanding. Being empathic involves connecting with clients by attuning to their thoughts and feelings. Of what is shared, one must consider content... Uh, the, their, the feelings that they're displaying, and possible meanings behind what they're saying. According to Norcross, the empathic practitioner attends to what is said and is at the periphery of awareness as well as what is said and is the focal awareness. So you need to attend to them. You need to understand what's going on. Empathy is seeing the world as that person sees it, not as you would see it uh, if you were in their situation feeling the way that uh, the person feels about the situation, understanding the meaning that the person is giving to events, grasping the assumption that influences their particular worldview. By being empathic, a practitioner can learn to connect with people from different backgrounds and experiences. The essence to building a client-practitioner relationship depends on whether the client feels understood. Clients will not share personal thoughts and feelings unless they feel understood. If a practitioner can establish a sense of empathic understanding with the client, they're more likely to build a therapeutic relationship. And of course, that's what you're trying to do. The only way you can help them is if they feel like you understand what they're talking about. You understand how they feel. Expressing empathy means communicating an understanding of another person's experience, their behavior, their viewpoint, their meanings, and the feelings. Empathy involves restating in your own words your understanding of what the client is expressing. When a practitioner uses empathic understanding, because the client feels understood, they're more likely to be open and trusting, to share more of their, their thoughts and feelings, uh, to help clients who are having trouble expressing themselves. When a practitioner uses empathic understanding, they are validating the client's experience. It shows the client that the practitioner accepts and understands the client's experiences and concerns. This is especially important if the client has been told that their point of view is incorrect due to an abusive relationship. And this is really quite, quite common uh, for people to, to try to control an individual by telling them they uh, whatever they think or whatever they feel is incorrect, uh, they, that they really don't feel that way. And um, the reality may be that they have uh, thoughts and feelings, but somebody is telling them that they shouldn't have those thoughts and feelings. This is very common, especially with, um, with a parent. Uh, this is very common, especially if we're dealing with a, a spouse that has uh, uh, power over a select individual. Students often feel awkward or uncomfortable trying to express empathic understanding. Most societal norms don't allow people to talk about feelings. Nodding and saying, mm-hmm, is less personal. When reflecting content, practitioners restate their understanding of what the client has said. This reflection of the client's reality indicates to the client that the practitioner is trying to understand. Are you saying, what I hear you saying is, as I understand it, it sounds like, and actually what you're saying is, I hear you. Practitioners must show that they are attuned to the client's emotional experiences, and they can do this by reflecting feelings. Besides what the client is saying, the client's feelings can be discerned from their body language, from their tone of voice, and, of course, from their facial expressions. 
Reflecting feelings may be accompanied by a softer voice or leaning forward to imply deeper connection with what the client is expressing. More firmness if the client is expressing negative emotions like anger, disgust, or dismay. Getting the client's feelings wrong is all right. As long as you share your hunches in a tentative voice, clients will probably feel comfortable correcting you. Some feelings are not as acceptable in select cultures as in others, and you need to be careful of that. You need to know uh, the, the uh, culture that you're dealing with and whether this emotion that you're, you're, you're giving them or that you're implying uh, is one that they, uh, that they can completely accept. Uh, I have uh, counseled individuals, and every time I try to, to uh, tell them what, what uh, I was hearing uh, them say, as far as their emotions were concerned, every time I was wrong. Uh, and eventually what would happen uh, after you know the, the fifth or the sixth uh, interaction with that client, they would come back and they'd say, you know, you were really right. Uh, I just didn't feel comfortable telling you that, you that you knew what you were talking about. And usually that had something to do, it had to do with a cathartic, something cathartic had happened between uh, the two of us, or, or just with them. They had confronted somebody that they didn't want to confront. And usually what was happening was the, that uh, they were telling me no because they couldn't tell other people no. Uh, so no matter what I said was wrong. And that's okay. They were using me uh, to practice uh, telling, telling somebody that they were uh, completely incorrect. And I didn't mind because I knew that that's what was happening. A reflecting feelings, client, you know, I, I haven't heard from any of them. If they are busy, they, sh they could at least email me. Practitioner might say, it sounds like you feel sad about that. The client sounding angry and speaking with a tight jaw, I feel like we just aren't getting anywhere. And the practitioner might say, you seem to be feeling impatient with me and our progress. The client on a team, some of the people on this team just aren't carrying their weight. And the practitioner might say, I'm guessing you're feeling kind of frustrated. The client, a family member looking scared, when they start fighting and yelling, I just run up to my room. The practitioner might say, I wonder if you feel kind of scared. The client says, yesterday out of the blue, I was one of the people they laid off. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. Practitioner might say, Wow, what sh shocking news. You look like you're feeling quite worried and upset. In common, in common conversation, many people believe that they're reflecting feelings, but are actually expressing thoughts, opinions, or judgment. This is usually because the individual is saying, I feel that, instead of I feel, uh, followed by an expression of feeling. I feel that uh, you aren't paying attention to me. Uh, that shows that you're uh, that you that's a judgment on your on your part I feel this assignment is too hard I feel that uh, you children should clean your room that's a directive I feel that you always misunderstand me thought and judgment I feel that this group is terrific that's a judgment as well I feel that you have uh, lots of, in, uh, of strengths. That's also a judgment. In families and groups, practitioners may encourage members to reflect feelings, especially in family situations. The practitioner can ask how they think someone else in the family feels. Often the problem in groups is that situations are engendering uh, feelings that are not being expressed or acknowledged. It is possible to reflect both content and feelings in the same sentence. Using this skill allows a practitioner to include more information in their reflective comment. The client, uh, can you believe it? She just left me a note telling me to leave. 
She hadn't said anything about leaving. The practitioner might say, it sounds like you were shocked when your wife told you that she wanted you to leave. The client, ever since I was laid off, I just mope around. I am just at a loss. The practitioner might say, so in a way, you're grieving about losing your job. A group at a picnic where one person didn't show up and didn't let them know. The practitioner, it seems like most of you are feeling hurt and a little angry that Mary Ann didn't show up at the picnic. The client, uh, child client, it is no fun to watch football games since dad left. The practitioner might say, so before your dad left, the two of you used to watch football games together, and now you feel sad and really miss him whenever the football games are on. Summarizing involves listening to considerable information provided by the client and communicating understanding of that information. Sometimes clients have so much information to share that practitioners listen for some time before making a reflecting comment. In the dominant culture in the United States, it is considered impolite to interrupt. Puh, it is considered impolite to interrupt. But after taking in masses of information from the client, it is considered appropriate for the practitioner to interrupt in order to summarize. Client, I am really trying hard in school, but I can't seem to get the grades that I want. Practitioner, you sound discouraged because even though you were working hard, you are disappointed with your grades. I'll tell you what, um, going back to, to this statement here, this is, I have, I've had counseling sessions where I didn't say hardly anything at all. Um, I nodded my head and, and I showed them that I was listening, but they were, they had so much to say that I just let them go. Uh, they needed to rant. Uh, they needed to uh, to get rid of all of these emotions, uh, the, and it was important for them. Uh, it was the only way that they could they uh, could deal with things. Sometimes people would be really embarrassed, and they wanted to get uh, this piece of information out as much as possible. So I just let them go, uh, and you know that's okay. That's you're not supposed to be a talker. You're supposed to be a listener. <laughs> so uh, listening as much as possible is a good thing, okay? Uh, I just want you to, to remember that. You know, we're going through all these things about, about showing them that you're listening to what they're saying. And this is important, but this is important to get them to continue to tell you things. Uh, sometimes you don't need to. Sometimes... The connection between the two of you is so, such that you don't have to say anything. Uh, this may be one of the reasons why people like to talk to me. Uh, it's mainly because I listen and I don't really say a whole lot. Makes me seem kind of dumb, but hey, that's okay. People, I've had people been my ear in a Walmart uh, line when we were uh, when we were getting ready to check out. And that's all right. If people really need to uh, to talk, then you know that's our job. I'm really trying hard to school. Okay, we already did this. Uh, you you sound discouraged because even though you were working hard, you were disappointed with your grades. Client, when I am angry with my friend, I tell her how I feel, and then she does the same thing again. Maybe we're not doing anything. Why didn't it come down? No, okay. Huh. At the beginning of, beginning of a session, as I remember our last meeting, we focused on how distressed you felt. Oh, this is, has to do with summarizing. So sometimes you can summarize at the beginning of a, of, of a session. As I remember our last meeting, we focused on how distressed you felt about your wife's roller coaster behavior toward you. When she's friendly, you feel good and get more work done. And when she's distant, you worry about uh, you worry and have trouble sleeping and focusing on work. Is that how you remember it? At the end of a session, you might summarize. We've discussed both sides of the issue and noted the pros and cons of each direction we could go. 
I appreciate how difficult this discussion has been for some of you. It appears that some members of the group seem to be troubled when people disagree with each other. Now, the reality is, I'm giving you, I'm showing you all of these things, but the reality is that we need to create our own voices. This is what I, I, I tell my students. We need to create our own voices. And, you know, so, well, this is so superficial. Yeah, this is uh, telling people all of these things. And maybe that's just not you. This is certainly not me. This is what they're suggesting in, in the textbook. But the reality is you're going to develop your own voice. And that's what you really need to do in order to be a good counselor. You need to develop your own voice. You need to develop your own voice that isn't mine. If you're repeating what Bradway says, then you're trying to be Bradway. <laughs> and that, you know, it's... <laughs> That might be okay. You want to act like a 72-year-old man, but uh, you yeah, want to act like a 72-year-old white guy. That's fine. But the reality is you need to develop your own voice. And the more authentic, remember we talked about genuineness. You know, th these are just suggestions. Uh, you need to have your own voice. And you need to, your voice is uh, your experiences, your age, your, your uh, culture. Um, all of those things have to be your gender. Uh, all of these things create your voice, and you need to have your own voice, okay? So these are just suggestions. These are not absolutes. Maybe. There we go. Okay. During a session with a group, everyone in the group seems relieved that we've agreed to keep all the information confidential. Uh, at the end of a session with the family, Jamie and Mary, you seem to be ready to take charge of some of the family problems. It has been hard to disagree with your children on what should happen next. I can imagine that you children are upset because you think your opinions don't count. Reflecting meaning is when a practitioner expresses their understanding of the underlying meaning of what the client is discussing. Reflecting meaning is not uh, as straightforward as understanding content or feelings. To understand meaning, practitioners need uh, to not only be good observers of the behavior and tone that uh, accompanies the content, but also must listen for the possible meaning uh, a client is giving to a situation, uh, to an action, to a thought, to a feeling. What might be important to you isn't important to your client. What is important to your client, you might think, well, that's not, that's not that important. But the reality may be that that's really important to your client. When working with clients who come from different backgrounds than your own, is, it is particularly important to express your tentative understanding of their meaning. For example, a student from, China, uh, from a Chinese or Chinese-American family must always get excellent grades or be considered a disgrace to their family. This is very common. Client wringing their hands and looking worried. I thought we had a good marriage until my husband told me that he lost his job and had spent our family money on seeing call girls. We are very religious and want to put this marriage back together. The practitioner. I hear you value your marriage at the same time, are shocked and worried about your husband's behavior. Is that right? Counseling group member, I really enjoy spending time with a man I am dating, but my job is so demanding these days that I am feeling stressed and worried about getting everything done. And the practitioner may say, it sounds like you really value time with George and also want to do a good job at work. Family member, since Bob, the father, lost his job, it seems like we go from one stress to the next all the time. It is like everyone is worried most of the time, not, uh, not at all like it used to be. And the practitioner may say, so the stress related to Bob being unemployed is affecting everyone. Sounds like you are longing for the fun times you used to have in your family. Task uh, group member, finishing this project is taking forever. I am sick of having to do so much extra work. I wonder if it is worth it. The practitioner may say, you sound frustrated and kind of discouraged, too. It sounds like you wonder if the project is as important as you once thought. Is that right? And you're pausing for response. 
how are you how are the rest of you feeling when developing a relationship it is important to deal directly with diversity variables for many clients having a worldview similar to that of the practitioner is more important than the differences in age ethnicity race gender sexual orientation education and physical differences language can prove to be a barrier even when the practitioner and the client speak the same language one may speak in slang one may speak using a, a great deal of jargon the client may be from a re region that the practitioner is not familiar with different generations may use the same words and phrases differently like hook up uh, hook up uh, in the old days uh, meant that you were attaching your trailer to your car. Now hook up means having sex with somebody that you didn't know very well. That's a hook up. I know. Okay, there's tons and tons of others. I'm way too old. I say groovy when I mean cool, uh, just as a joke, pretty pretty much. But uh, uh, you know, so people have different meanings and things. It is important to express empathy in cases where the client is from a different ethnic group, a different age, a different gender, a different religion, has different physical abilities. Conveying that you completely understand how they feel is rarely accurate and hardly useful. She lost her leg. Do I know what it feels like to lose a leg? No. Uh, you know, I've got all all four of my limbs, I, I can't possibly know what she feels like. I can't possibly understand how she feels about this because for one thing I'm male and for another thing I have never lost a limb. Your goal is to understand how the client feels, what they, they experienced and what meaning that experience had for them. Empathic understanding increases the client's sense of being understood it takes considerable courage to openly discuss concerns with a stranger. And that is the end of chapter 8. Let's go on to chapter 9, gaining further understanding. <clears throat> Before asking questions, it is important to express understanding by reflecting feelings, content, meaning and summarizing and that we just went over that questioning without expressing understanding may seem like grilling open-ended questions are questions that require more than one or two word answers they invite clients to express opinions and feelings open-ended questions generally begin with who what when or how how do you feel about that tell me about open-ended questions will you tell me about more about Will you tell me more about how you feel when? Will you explain more about? Tell me, I love this. I love that statement from Albert Einstein. If you can't explain it simply so that people can understand it, you don't really understand it well enough yourself. Tell me about who has helped you with this problem. How have other people helped you with this problem? What led you to seek help at this time? Tell me about improvements you have noticed since our last appointment. What would your life be like if this problem wasn't going on? How have others you know solved this type of problem? Who have you talked to about this problem? How did it help to talk to others about this problem? Tell me about what it feels like to have this problem. How have you solved other problems in your, in your life? What do you understand about the kind of help I might offer you? Tell me about what you have done to work on this problem. Closed-ended questions are questions that can be answered with one or two words. Closed-ended questions are appropriate when the counselor is seeking specific information. How old are you? What is your address? How many other people live in your house? They give you facts and are easy to, to answer. 
Skilled practitioners choose the type of question to ask based on, a, based on their goals. Beginning practitioners often overuse closed-ended questions. Using closed-ended questions may imply a practitioner's need to be in control rather than work collaboratively with the client. Some clients treat open-ended questions as closed-ended questions by giving one-word responses. It is necessary for the counselor to encourage them to speak more. Tell me more about is, is a good way to get them to say more if you can. Sometimes they're pissed and they don't want to be there and they're, they're, you're not going to be able to get them to talk. When did this problem start? Yesterday. <laughs> what do you like about school? Recess, obviously. What do you do when your husband comes home drunk? Let him puke. Do you check in with each other at the beginning of their meetings? No. Do you eat dinner together? No. Asking more than one question at a time. Asking more than one question at a time is confusing. In their reply, they will only answer one question, and you may potentially miss important information. Is it hard for you both to work and study? How does your family feel about this? Don't ever do that. Just one question at a time. Asking multiple choice questions uh, uh, may inhibit the uh, client's exploration. How do you feel about that? Sad, confused, angry? However, with a client who has a limited vocabulary or isn't used to expressing their feelings in words, the occasional multiple choice question can help. And this is a cartoon up, down, all of the above, none of the above. <laughs> What are you standing in front of the elevator for if you don't want to go anywhere? Uh, asking rapid-fire questions. Uh, uh, while this form of questioning is common in some cultures, most people feel that uh, this style fits more with interrogation, uh, not with creating cooperative working relationships. Attempts at showing understanding should come between questions. And this is kind of a problem. I Personally, I feel that people from the East Coast talk too fast. Uh, and a lot of times uh, they talk so fast that uh, I'd like to think about what people are saying, you know. So uh, there are there are places in the United States where they talk too fast and they ask rapid fire questions. And this can be a problem. So if you're that kind of a person, don't don't ask me any questions. <laughs> and as people get older, they need things slowed down a little bit. And I am old. I understand that. Questions with a suggestion embedded. Uh, sometimes questions are used to inform or persuade clients about their point of view. Don't you think it is important for you to go back to school and complete your GED? That's not really a question. You're telling them to go back to school and complete their GED. What do you think uh, of trying to exercise more to decrease your depressed mood? You're not really asking them a question. You're telling them to, to exercise more, and maybe that will that will reduce their depressed mood. Questions that begin with why often invite people to feel defensive. Why questions rarely invite open discussion and may be experienced as attacking. People actually often aren't aware of why they act the way that they do. So don't ask them why. Problems or challenges are important to explore. The history of, of the, the problem or challenge, the length or duration of it, uh, current changes, how, how, how have things changed uh, over time? I can't imagine she's doing that. Previously employed attempts at a solution, uh, the severity and the frequency of a problem. These are all pieces of information that, uh, that are important to explore. Using scaling questions can be valuable. Using a 1 to 10 scale to rate an aspect of a problem what aspects of the client's life are affected by the problem, the situation and environment are also important and can sometimes give a more complete perspective on the problem. Okay, on a scale of 1 to 10, how do you feel about this? Okay, oh, a Likert scale. Oh, goody, goody. 
A nurturing and sustaining environment can support a client through many stressors. That's not a Likert scale, not a 1 to 10. A Likert scale is a 1 to 5 scale, so, okay, actually. A nurturing and sustaining environment can support a client through many stressors. What life stressors has the client experienced? A number of children and other people in the house, job demands, deaths uh, in the family, illnesses, and or major health challenges. Now, one of the interesting things about, about this book is that these three ladies went, uh, are from Ball State. Ball State is my home. That, I was born in Muncie, Indiana, and that's where Ball State is, as weird as that is. I grew up, uh, I was raised in, in Muncie, Indiana. So these three women <laughs> are, are from Indiana. I think they're from Ball State. They may be from, from Indiana University. Uh, anyway, I'm from Indiana, and, and it's as I'm reading through this, a lot of this, uh, I, I, can, I can hear uh, uh, the voices of the people that I grew up with, as weird as that is. Uh, in Indiana, it's fine to ask about deaths, but of course, on the reservation, uh, that is taboo, so uh, you can scratch that one out. <clears throat> it's okay if you're in Muncie, but uh, if you're anyplace else, you better stay away from it. What life stressors has a client experienced? Current or past traumatic events in family or community? Demands related to school, church involvement, uh, volunteer activities? Uh, these can be the stressors. If the practitioner is genuine, clients feel more comfortable exploring uh, being stiff, distracted, or, or uh, they feel more comfortable exploring. Uh, being stiff, distracted, or detached does not indicate genuineness. Genuineness is indicated by being natural, by being sincere, by being authentic, by being candid, by being honest, and by being forthright. That is genuineness. And that is the end of that chapter. So, okay, so uh, one of the things I need to tell you is that uh, you need to get your histories in. We need to get this uh, on the 10th week. This is the sixth week. This is the sixth week, week lecture, and I'm making it on the fifth week, of course, uh, so that it's prepared for next week. Uh, but uh, when, you, when you look at this lecture, this is the sixth week, and in four more weeks, we're going to start counseling. In four more weeks, we're going to be done with all of the lectures. So you won't have anything to do for the last five weeks except for this class, except to do the counseling. And if you haven't turned in a history, if you haven't come up with a problem, then you can't do that. And there's no way that you can pass the class. So what you need to do is... You need to come up with a problem. You need to create the uh, the history form is on the website, is on the, uh, the Blackboard site under assignments, I believe. Um, fill that out. It's a it's a doc. It's a, a document form uh, point uh, dot doc X. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, email it to me. And once you email it to me, I will put it on the discussion page. Uh, what we will be doing uh, when, we, when you do your counseling, um, after you do your counseling, you're going to write up your notes about the counseling session, and you're going to put them under your client's name. Your folk, the, uh, the, the person that you uh, uh, counseled. And that's how I will know that you are done. Now you can, if you counsel and don't put the uh, your counseling notes down, I won't know that you did it. So that's how we're going to do it. Um, how many how many are, are we required to do? How many am I requiring you to do? Well, there's 15 weeks. The first 10 weeks are lecture. The last five weeks are counseling, and you have to do two counseling sessions a week. That's 10. Uh, 10 is your required number. So that's what we're doing. Um, you, if, if you think that's too much, um, I'm sorry. That's what I've, I've done uh, since I've been here. Uh, and I've actually done this in other places as well. Uh, but at, at other institutions, um, 
there you go. That's what we need. Uh, we're in it. We are in the sixth week. Uh, you've got four more weeks to get your history in, and then we'll start counseling. Even after we start counseling, you can turn your history in and uh, start doing counseling. You need to be. You need to be able to interact with each other uh, because people uh, will will need to do counseling sessions. Usually, you can trade them back and forth. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll counsel you if you, you, you will counsel me. That's not the way it works. Uh, I'll let you counsel me if you, if you let me counsel you. That's the way it usually works. Okay. So, um, that's what we need to do. Um, uh, <laughs> okay. I'll talk to you guys next week.